Hello, everyone. I am Madhavi Sunder, the Associate Dean for Graduate and International Programs and Professor of Law at Georgetown University Law Center in Washington, DC. A warm welcome to all of you joining us today for this conference on intellectual property, COVID-19, and the next pandemic, diagnosing problems, developing cures. We have over 600 registrants from across the world for this critical discussion of the role of intellectual property in the race to vaccinate the world. This two-day conference featuring leading thinkers from academia, policy, and public health activism grows out of a collaboration between the Georgetown University Law Center and the University of Hong Kong Faculty of Law. It's been a true honor to partner on this event with my co-convener, a global colleague and longtime friend, Professor Houchin Sen of HKU. We are fortunate to be able to kick off the program today with welcome remarks from our two deans, Dean William Trainer of Georgetown Law and Dean Haoling Fu of the University of Hong Kong Faculty of Law. First, a really hearty thank you to both deans, Dean Trainer and Dean Fu, for supporting this timely and critical conference and collaboration. I wanna now introduce uh, my dean, Bill Trainer. He was Dean and Executive Vice President and Paul Regis Dean Leadership Chair at the Georgetown University Law Center. Dean Trainer. Well, thank you very much, Dean Sunder. And I'm honored to welcome our international audience to this timely and critically important global conference focused on how to promote <laughs> more equitable distribution of vaccines in this pandemic and the next. At Georgetown Law, our motto is laws, but the means justice is the end. And the conference asks, what is the role and obligation of intellectual property law in promoting just access to medicines? Is the role of this law only to incentivize the production of medicines with no say in their just distribution? As we've witnessed too starkly, global access to vaccines in a pandemic is a moral imperative and an economic and health necessity. The pandemic that has raged for nearly two years now has made clear that no one is safe until everyone is safe. Georgetown Law is particularly delighted to co-lead this event with our friends at the University of Hong Kong Faculty of Law. Thank you, Dean Fu, for your collaboration and for your support of this important dialogue. Special thanks to Professor Hao Chen Sun of HKU and Georgetown Law's Associate Dean for Graduate and International Programs and Professor Law, Professor of Law Madhavi Sunder, who we just heard from, for their work to develop this important program. They plan to publish papers developed from this meeting in an academic volume. As the conference title suggests, the goal is to reform law to promote widespread vaccine access in low and middle income, income countries now and to better prepare for the next pandemic. And I also wanna thank and recognize three Georgetown centers which are co-sponsoring this event. First, the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health where three of our conference participants, Georgetown Law Professors Lawrence Gaston and Matt Cavanaugh and O'Neill Consultant Kashisha Neha have been leading the global conversation on health justice during the pandemic. Professor Gostin, a university professor and the director of the O'Neill Institute, has been working closely with the Biden administration, the WHO, the World Bank, and Gavi on the global COVID-19 response. Additionally, thank you to the Georgetown Law Institute for Technology, Law, and Policy, where Dean Sunder is a faculty leader, and to the Center for Asian Law, another co-sponsor of this two-day program. So I'm grateful to the speakers gathered here today and tomorrow for their global leadership and moral courage to think creatively. So law may be the means to promote just distribution of life-saving medicines. Thank you. Dean Sunder. Thanks so much, Dean Trainer. Next, we'll hear some opening remarks from Haling Fu, Dean and Warren Chan Professor in Human Rights and Responsibilities at the University of Hong Kong Faculty of Law. Hi, uh, dear Dean uh, Trainer and Professor Sander, colleagues and uh, friends, good morning and uh, good evening. Uh, I'm so delighted that we are able to co-host um, uh, yet another magnificent uh, conference on a cutting edge topic. 
Uh, this is really a, a dream team looking at all the stars uh, from different parts of the world talking about a, a significant timely issue. I want to uh, thank uh, Professor Sander and my colleague uh, Yang Hao Chen for their vision and uh, for their organization. It is really unfortunate that uh, I cannot uh, welcome all of you to Hong Kong uh, to uh, have a face-to-face -face conference uh, as we uh, originally uh, env envisaged. Let me just say a few words about Hong Kong and uh, Hong Kong University and our faculty. Hong Kong, as you all know, is experiencing a, a significant and a challenging transition towards a, a future which remains to be defined clearly. Naturally, there are doubts, concerns, and even anxieties on the part of, uh, of students, colleagues, and uh, friends. As an academic institution, our university has received our due share uh, of the impact of the uh, national security law, and the process is still ongoing. But I can ensure all of you that nothing has changed in our academic programs and our international collaboration. We teach to the same curriculum, follow the same syllabus, and assign to students the same reading materials. We strive to maintain our academic standard and integrity. We remain firmly committed to academic freedom in our teaching, research, as we always done. We organize and participate in uh, international events like this as much as uh, uh, possible to demonstrate our resilience and our determination. So on that note, I wish the conference a great success and um, we are eager to invite all of you to visit Hong Kong and Hong Kong U in the near future. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dean Fu. This uh, horrible 18 months and more now has uh, shown us all the more the importance of global collaboration. So we are really, truly grateful for this. And we also uh, look forward to the time when we can be physically together again. But thankfully, um, Zoom has enabled us to still uh, move forward with these important collaborations. Um, I'd like to just spend a few minutes now to set the stage for our conversation over the next two days. So we begin with the tragic reality of global vaccine inequity. Of the 7 billion vaccines that have been administered to date, over 70% have gone to high income countries, while less than 4% of people in low income countries have received the jab. Africa in particular lags far behind Europe and Asia, with many countries, including Nigeria, Mali, and Uganda, hovering around a mere 1% vaccinated. How did we get here? And what role, if any, did intellectual property law play in bringing about this vaccine apartheid? As UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres powerfully put it, we passed the science test, but we're getting an F in ethics. We celebrated the uh, role of intellectual property in the development of the vaccines. And though this is a story that's more complicated and we'll hear about that, patents and other IP did incentivize investment into breakthrough technology. But is IP's role limited to development, but not distribution? Efficiency, but not e equity? This conference seeks to broaden our understanding of the implications of IP on access to essential medicines and essential technologies such as vaccines. How may IP be an obstacle to equitable distribution of pandemic medicines? And how may it be reformed now and for a future pandemic? One of the key obstacles to vaccine access continues to be limited supply. Experts argue that despite the billions of vaccines already administered, billions more are needed. 
Vaccine makers said since March that they were on track to meet the production needs themselves. But that hasn't happened as we near the end of 2021. Vaccine makers blame limited access to raw materials. Public health advocates say the problem is intellectual property as vaccine make, uh, manufacturers hoard their knowledge and refuse to license their technology to potential manufacturers. The New York Times recently identified six manufacturing companies around the world, several in India, that have the facilities, experience, and reputation to safely produce mRNA vaccines. But thus far, Moderna and Pfizer have refused to share critical technology with them. In October 2020, South Africa and India proposed an IP waiver in the WTO to waive intellectual property rights, including patents, trade secrets, and copyrights in COVID-19 related products, including treatments, diagnostics, and vaccines. The proposed broad waiver would include more than vaccines, but also, for example, the newly announced Merck treatment pill that would sell for $700 a treatment course. Though 100 low and middle income countries supported the waiver, it was stalled in WTO negotiations because the institution operates by consensus and many high income countries resisted. The waiver seemed to get a boost last May when the US announced support, but key countries, including Germany and Switzerland, continue to object and the US has done little to convince them otherwise. The experts have gathered here at this conference now over the next two days and they will consider many questions among which are, can we meet the goal of global vaccinations by relying on drug manufacturers alone? And should private industry, forgive the pun, call all the shots during a global emergency such as this one? Can voluntary donations from high income countries and voluntary mechanisms such as COVAX solve the problem without circumventing intellectual property rights? The answer thus far seems to be no. Though the US has pledged to donate 1 billion while only delivering 200 million of those doses so far, that generous donation greater than other nations combined is yet still a drop in the bucket compared to the need. And COVAX has not come close to meeting its delivery goals in low income countries. If the current approaches through voluntary mechanisms aren't working, what are the key legal levers to expanding access to COVID-19 vaccines? Is an IP waiver necessary? Beyond compulsory licensing for patents, what are the prospects for technology transfer of trade secrets and know-how by vaccine manufacturers to local manufacturers in South America, Asia, and Africa? Can the US force companies to share their knowledge with global manufacturers to scale up production to end the pandemic? Or do the causes of vaccine inequity lie elsewhere entirely? For example, in local infrastructure in poor countries. Our speakers today and tomorrow will address these questions and more. Tomorrow, our keynote and a panel will consider the prospects for local manufacture of vaccines, vaccines made in Africa for Africa. Tom Frieden, the former director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the United States, describes local manufacture as, quote, our insurance policy against variants and production failure, unquote. Finally, uh, our conference considers how to better uh, do better in the next pandemic. What are the prospects for a pandemic treaty and how would that help avoid the current predicament? What's the right international institution to lead us? How would a WHO backed mRNA hub in Africa work? So stay tuned. Our experts over the next two days will discuss all of this and more. Some last thank yous. Special thanks to the Law and Technology Center of the University of Hong Kong, in particular to the center's executive assistant, Grace Chan, and research officer, Michael Chung. Here at Georgetown, I wanna especially thank Chris Hammer and our events team, the inimitable Kyle Bernard Bernardos, who is going to be with us, uh, shepherding us through the next two days in information technology, Mabel Shaw for library assistance, and my own RAs, Sophie Mehta and Abby Moranegbade, for assistance before and during the conference. It's now time to turn to the introduction of our uh, wonderful keynote speaker, our opening keynote for this morning, uh, uh, Dr. Edward Kwakwa. So Dr. Edward Kwakwa is the Assistant Director General of the World Intellectual Property Organization. Before assuming his role as Assistant Director General in Global Challenges and Partnerships uh, uh, sector, 
Mr. Kwakwa was general counsel for WIPO from 2004 to 2016. Dr. Kwakwa holds an LLB from the University of Ghana, an LLM from Queen's University in Canada, and an LLM and SJD from the Yale Law School. Assistant Director General Kwakwa will address the question, what is the role of the World Intellectual Property Organization in the COVID-19 pandemic? We will um, hopefully have uh, at least a few minutes for some Q&A at the end of uh, Dr. Kwakwa's remarks. So please enter, uh, feel free to enter your questions and comments into the chat. Welcome Assistant Director General Kwakwa. Thank you very much, Professor Sunda, for this very generous introduction. Good, good afternoon, or maybe it's good morning to you in Washington, DC. Good evening, wherever you are. It's just a delight to be a part of this conference. And I should like to start by thanking Professors Madabu Sunda and Professor Hao Chen Sam for inviting me to be a part of this conference. I should also extend to you very warm greetings from my boss, who happens to be the Director General of WIPO, Mr. Darren Tang. And for those of you who do not know, Mr. Tang is an alumnus of Georgetown. So I guess it's very fitting that I have been invited to come be a part of this conference today. I would of course love to talk a little bit about my organization by way of introduction, but I only have 40 minutes maximum. So I'm simply going to have to assume you all know enough about WIPO for purposes of context for my statement today. But maybe I'll take a minute to refer to the mandate of my organization. And it's simply to remind you WIPO is one of the specialized agencies of the United Nations. And under the leadership of our Director General, who is alumnus of Georgetown, the organization's vision is simply a world where innovation and creativity from anywhere, a world where innovation and creativity from anywhere are supported by intellectual property and this for the good of everyone. So that in simple terms is our current mission and our vision. And against this background, let me delve straight into my subject. What is the role of the World Intellectual Property Organization in the COVID-19 pandemic? And on this, let me start by saying, why Po considers WIPO considers that winning the battle against the COVID-19 is indeed one of the world's most pressing and immediate challenges. There is no doubt about that for us in WIPO. And in that context, we do believe in vaccine equity. We do believe in vaccine equity in the same sense in which we believe at WIPO that no one is safe until everyone is safe. And we all heard Professor Dean Trainer say a short while ago, no one is safe until we are all safe. So that's very important to put on the record. For this reason, at WIPO, we fully support global efforts to find solutions that can ramp up COVID-19 vaccine production during these unprecedented times. This is the context for my presentation this afternoon. Let me also remind you that although WIPO is not a health organization, development considerations are an integral part of WIPO's work. And this approach is contained in WIPO's development agenda adopted by the member states of WIPO as far back as 2007. And incidentally, WIPO has an entire sector called the Global Challenges and Partnerships Sector, which among other things is dedicated to ensuring that WIPO's work contributes to the shared realization 
of the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. And I am happy to lead that sector. I should also add, just two weeks ago, WIPO's 193 member states instructed us, the Secretariat, to join the UN's Sustainable Development Group. So effective January 2022, WIPO will become a member of the UN SDG. Now, in case you are all wondering, where am I going with all this? Please rest assured, it is directly related to our theme for today. Indeed, even more importantly for our discussion this afternoon as well as tomorrow, the sector I lead happens to be in charge of WIPO's activities as they relate to the COVID-19 pandemic. The sector is also responsible for WIPO's trilateral relations with the World Trade Organization and with the World Health Organization. These are both topics that are important in any discussion on COVID-19 pandemic, the international community's response, and what we can do about it. So we come to the topic. And a question often heard, it's not just in Geneva we hear this question, we hear it everywhere. Where is WIPO in the COVID-19 space? You pick up newspapers or you read news blogs and all you read about is the fact that discussions on the pandemic are centered on the IP waiver proposal. We heard Professor Sunda mention the fact that South Africa and India had come up with this proposal in October last year. That seems to be where all the attention is focused. And if it's not there, you read other blogs and you read about how the World Health Organization's Dr. Tedros, the Director General of WHO, is articulating a very, very clear position that WTO members, he's not talking about WHO members, he's referring to WTO members, and in his mind, WTO members should adopt the waiver proposal brought by South Africa and India. And then you ask yourself, is WIPO in fact the UN specialized agency with a mandate to promote the protection of intellectual property? So let's go to the facts. First of all, in my mind at least, I think it is clear that intellectual property is left, it is right, and it is center in any COVID-19 discussions. I have no doubt, and just about everyone in WIPO has no doubt, that without the IP system, we couldn't have arrived at the situation we have today during this pandemic, where there are so many effective vaccines already approved by the competent regulatory agencies within such a short space of time. That is clearly unprecedented. As relates to the fact that WHO's Director General makes clear and unambiguous positions on the waiver proposal taking place and being discussed at the WTO, I personally don't see this as necessarily a new development. And in fact, in this context, I simply want to recall several years back when we had Margaret Chan as the Director General of the WHO. She went over and above the call of duty, I would say. She went out of her way when we came to discussion of the WTO's tobacco plane packaging case to say, but this is a no brainer. Australia must win this case hands down. In other words, you had a director general of the World Health Organization seemingly taking very strong positions on issues that were being deliberated at the World Trade Organization. And you can't blame WHO for that because their mandate, as we all know, 
is to attain the highest standard of health worldwide. And that includes making statements and pronouncements when it comes to whether it's tobacco plane packaging or in this case, the COVID-19 pandemic. So again, I don't see that as a necessary new development. But my response to the question, is WIPO really the IP agency that is responsible for the promotion of the protection of intellectual property? I have a categorical yes answer to that question. And I simply add the fact that WIPO has such a mandate doesn't mean WIPO is going to be shouting from the mountaintops this is intellectual property, so we must protect it. Indeed, under the new dispensation we have in WIPO, and I'm referring to Director General Darren Tang and his eight new sector leads, we are basing our mission in WIPO on promoting a balanced and effective global intellectual property ecosystem for a more sustainable future. And the emphasis again is on a balanced and effective global intellectual property system, which will ensure for all of us a better and more sustainable future. We are not talking about a maximalist intellectual property ecosystem. We are talking about a balanced and effective intellectual property ecosystem. I think it's important to understand this is what has guided WIPO's involvement in the COVID-19 space to date. So what has WIPO's involvement in the COVID-19 space to date been? And with this one, let me start with the WTO waiver proposal. We all know this is the most talked about aspect of the pandemic at least in intellectual property terms. And on the WTO discussion, I think I need to recall that WIPO is simply an observer at the WTO. We are an intergovernmental organization of 193 member states, and we are a specialized agency of the UN. And in that capacity, we are an observer at discussions taking place at the WTO's TRIPS Council. We all know the rights that observers have. It means we get to participate in all formal meetings of the TRIPS Council. We do not get to participate in informal meetings of the TRIPS Council. No observer gets to do that. But think about it most of the important discussions taking place do take place in informal settings more than they do in formal settings. And I'm not laying the blame on WTO. They have their system. It's the same in WIPO. We have lots of observers, but a lot of the time when the member states go into informal discussions, the observers tend to be excluded whether for good or for bad. That notwithstanding, I should stress, WIPO has nevertheless taken part in every single WTO TRIPS Council formal meeting since the pandemic has been with us. WIPO has issued very clear statements on WIPO's position. Even our Director General, together with Dr. Singozi, and Tedros, and this was just a few months ago, has participated in a huge event put up by WTO on vaccine manufacturing. So it's not that WIPO has been absent as such. In fact, WIPO has declared its commitment to take measures to support equitable access to COVID-19 tools. And when we talk about COVID-19 tools, we include not just vaccines, but also therapeutics, diagnostics, and as I will explain later, the goal of achieving vaccine equity 
is a rather complex and multifaceted one. It's clearly not as easy as we think it is. But still, let's not joke about this. It is important that we continue supporting innovations in healthcare, innovations in medicine, by ensuring that we give the right incentives to encourage investments in such innovations. Indeed, there can be no doubt, absolutely no doubt, that the intellectual property system plays a key role in providing incentives to our innovators and to industry. We need more success stories to be sure, including what we have just heard in the last couple of days about the pharmaceutical company Merck coming out with a pill for COVID-19, which has been approved already by at least one country. I believe it's been approved by the United Kingdom. Clearly, if all goes well, this could be a game changer. And there has to be a way of ensuring such innovation continues. On this note, I am happy to announce that Merck is one of the founding partners of one of the eight companies. These are pharmaceutical companies that we are working with in WIPO in another area, not dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, but this is what we call WIPO research. It's a consortium among WIPO, BVGH, based in Seattle, and then we have eight pharmaceutical companies who together are trying to show how best the intellectual property system can be used to show its uses as a force for good. And in this area, WIPO research deals with tuberculosis, malaria, and neglected tropical diseases. But that's a slight sidetrack. We are talking about COVID-19 today. And COVID-19, as you know, has a lot of pharmaceutical industry support. It's the only reason why we have so many vaccines already approved. That doesn't apply in the WIPO research area. But let me stick to COVID-19 for today. Over the last year and so, we clearly have seen the fastest ever development and deployment of vaccines in history. And here again, I'm talking about COVID-19. I believe this remarkable achievement is the result of human ingenuity and common purpose. Common purpose, which has been built over decades of investments in health innovations, and which has been supported by the coming together of the worlds of innovation, health, and trade. Innovation, health, and trade. But, but while we acknowledge this achievement, we also see that vaccine distribution in particular is unequal. It remains unequal, and this is definitely not acceptable. It is not acceptable that we continue to have an equal vaccine distribution. We all know indeed that the successful discovery of several vaccines against COVID-19 has ended up shifting the world's attention from the fact that we need even more innovation on COVID-19 treatments. It's not just vaccines we need, we need therapeutics as well. It's all good when we hear Merck has come up with a pill. We need even more of those to change the situation we have today. And in this context, I would humbly suggest a robust intellectual property system does provide the incentives for further innovation in this field. So the task for those working on IP and global health issues is clearly to find the right balance between intellectual property rights and access to global health. We need a balance. We are not suggesting we tilt it one way or the other. What we need is the balance between the two. And so in this context, I do believe it's important to recall 
that vaccines are complex. They are a complex issue, and it's not just the patent that is decisive when we talk about vaccines. Know-how, for example, is also extremely important. In other words, it's not just one type of intellectual property we are talking about. WIPO remains committed in this broad context to supporting and facilitating partnerships and any type of collaboration that is necessary to scale up vaccine production globally. It is committed to provide an enabling environment for innovation and tech transfer. Technology transfer is very crucial when we talk about vaccine manufacturing capability. And WIPO is available to support its members' use of technology to drive good health outcomes. Indeed, as WIPO's Director General, Darren Tang, and I keep mentioning the fact that he's an alumnus of Georgetown. This is a Georgetown Hong Kong University conference, so it's good to lay it on the table. As Georgetown alumnus Darren Tang has frequently pointed out, the ideal scenario would be in this pandemic context, if the international community could have at least three or four countries in each region of the world. I am particularly referring to the developing country regions since the developed country regions already have the necessary vaccine manufacturing capacity. But it would be great if at least three or four countries could be identified in each developing region of the world who had the vaccine manufacturing capabilities. And this is something that could be put up within the next 18 to 36 months if the international community had the wherewithal to do this. So in the interim, the incentives provided by the global intellectual property system have over decades encouraged investments in health-related innovations. And this is what in turn has played a part in the very rapid development of COVID-19 vaccines worldwide. Specifically talking about WIPO's work in the pandemic era, it has consisted of various interventions that are all in line with our mandate, WIPO's mandate and the decisions adopted by WIPO's member states. Before mentioning those interventions, though, I should like to provide a general background on how WIPO sees intellectual property in the context of medical technologies, in the context of medical technologies. And here, I should like to refer to the WIPO WTO agreement of 1995, through which WIPO provides legislative and technical assistance relating to WTO's TRIPS agreement. So in this context, government offices in charge of drafting laws have frequently requested advice from WIPO, and WIPO is doing this through its agreement with the WTO, the depository of the TRIPS agreement. So WTO members as well as WIPO member states have sought advice from WIPO regarding how best they can use the TRIPS flexibilities enshrined in the system. And WIPO has provided this advice after giving careful consideration to the flexibilities, to the consistency in relation to the TRIPS agreement that is required and to the legal, technical, and economic implications of any such positions to be taken by the member states in question. At the same time, it's tried knowledge that the COVID-19 pandemic has raised issues at the crossroads of public health, trade, and intellectual property policy, including the management of innovation and access, issues related to technology transfer, etc. And we all know it's the IP system that has a number of features supporting and facilitating research and development access, including certain, having certain exclusions from patentable subject matter, for example, or having limited exceptions to patent rights. These are all built into the intellectual property system. 
And all these options are available to support countries' access to medical technology, as well as innovation policies. And they do include, for example, research and regulatory review exceptions. Available policy measures also include compulsory licensing. They do include government use licensing. So it's not as if we don't have available options. We do have options. The question is how best these options can be used so they have maximum impact and so they fulfill the original reasons for which they were adopted in the first place. And in trying to promote this, WIPO has been reaching out worldwide to explain the potential for intellectual property to contribute towards vaccine equity through the creation of the right incentives to bridge the gap between vaccine production capabilities and the needs of everyone everywhere. In WIPO, it's very important to us that we narrow the gaps existing between countries when it comes to technological availability and use. To go more specifically on COVID-related assistance that WIPO has been providing, we have announced a package of support measures to assist our member states in addressing the COVID-19 pandemic. WIPO has also indicated its commitment to support member states use intellectual property to build a sustainable economic recovery following the pandemic. And this brings me to a title in the theme of this conference, but I'll come to that in a minute. It refers to after the pandemic. Let me mention though, the package we have announced to our member states and it's worldwide knowledge now. It includes one, policy and legislative assistance. Two, technical assistance and capacity building. Three, innovation support and technology transfer. Four, IP dispute resolution. As you may know, we do have an arbitration and mediation center that effectively helps resolve disputes in intellectual property. And five, knowledge resources. These are specific areas in which the organization has made its services available to its member states and in addition, we have just had our 2022-2023 program and budget approved by the member states. And that program and budget, in addition to what the Secretariat originally proposed, and when I say Secretariat, I'm referring to the Secretariat under the leadership of Director General Tang, subsequently proposed another 4 million Swiss francs. And when I say 4 million, Swiss francs today, for those of you based in the US, that's slightly more than 4 million US dollars to include in the budget just on COVID-19 measures to help our 193 member states better deal with the COVID pandemic. In addition, within the framework of WIPO's development agenda, WIPO has established a global network of technology and innovation support centers. And more than 40% of these centers have technology specialization in health and life sciences. So these centers are able to drive innovation forward by building knowledge and supporting technology transfer capabilities and structures. And as I mentioned, tech transfer happens to be one of the most important areas when we talk about COVID and vaccine manufacturing capacity. So just to give a practical example, in Guinea, Guinea, not Ghana, my country, Guinea, one of our 193 member states, WIPO's focal point was able to organize a working group with 10 universities in the country and other research centers to review research and identify specifically inventions that could support efforts to fight the pandemic. And one invention in particular happens to have caught WIPO's eye. This was an automatic hand washing device developed by the Institut Superior de Technologie de Mamou, based in Guinea. Thanks to their support in drafting 
a patent application was filed with ORP. ORP is the African Organization for Intellectual Property, the French speaking, not Aripo, the English speaking one. And ORP did in fact grant a patent for this invention in November last year. So the invention has even subsequently received the West African Economic and Monetary Union's prize for best invention in the fight against COVID-19. And I only give this as one example of practical and concrete support that WIPO provides to low and middle income member states to help them better deal with the pandemic. Let me mention the trilateral cooperation we have because I mentioned WHO, I've mentioned WTO. So there's always been trilateral collaboration among these three organizations. But it just so happens that this pandemic has brought to the fore the need for even closer collaboration among WIPO, WHO, and WTO. So right now, there are two new directors general in WIPO. There is a third director, gen sorry, in WIPO and WTO. And there is a third director general in WHO who is going on to a second mandate as we expect he will get elected, he's the sole candidate. So what happened is the director general in WIPO who is new decided, well, maybe I should get together with my counterparts in WHO and WTO. And together we brainstorm on what we can do collectively to assist our respective members and governments deal with the pandemic. The DG of WIPO hosted Drs. Tedros and Ngozi, I think it was at the end of June, in WIPO. And following that meeting in WIPO, they collectively took two important decisions. The first was they agreed to intensify the trilateral cooperation among the three organizations. And to this effect, they decided they would hold a series of workshops, a series of workshops specifically on COVID-19 related topics, just like Georgetown and Hong Kong University are doing today and tomorrow. The first of those series of workshops was held on the 27th of September. And again, it was hosted by us in WIPO, although it was mostly a hybrid event. That first in the series was on innovation in and access to COVID-19 technologies, 27th of September. There it focused particularly on technology transfer and licensing, given that these are two of the most important topics in this area. The second important decision the three directors general took when they met at WIPO in June was to decide, let's collectively create a gateway a gateway where all our member states can go to request any assistance they want in the intellectual property area, in the innovation area, in the trade area, or indeed in the public health area. That gateway, it actually should have been a platform, but if we had called it a platform, its acronym would have been technical assistance platform, technical assistance, technology platform, TTAP in other words, which clearly is too close to CTAP belonging to WHO. So instead of calling it a platform, we call it a gateway. And it's a gateway that's going to be of immense benefit, not just to member states of WIPO, but also to the member states of WHO and to the members of WTO. Again, in the COVID space, I should like to mention WIPO is a member of the Medicines Patent Pool's governing body, the Medicines Patent Pool we all know. And the WIPO has put its expertise at the availability of the Medicines Patent Pool. They are mission to increase access to and to facilitate the development of life-saving medicines, especially for low and middle income countries. We hope, and we think we have seen this so far, 
WIPO's role on the executive board of the medicines patent pool will allow us to leverage our strengths in support of the global community's response to the COVID-19 and other pressing global health challenges. I could mention patent scope, I could mention the COVID-19 search facility, I could mention the COVID-19 glossary, which has been added to the WIPO Perl database, but I don't want to sound like I'm simply providing a laundry list. So before I'm told my time has run out, I want to end my remarks by referring to an issue suggested in the title of this conference. And that issue is the fact that we call it the next pandemic. It is incorporated in the title of the conference. In this context, WIPO looks beyond the immediate crisis and it's hoping to support preparations to combat future pandemics. There will no doubt be future pandemics. The innovation that we have seen during this pandemic and the capacity that has been built to respond to this emergency, I believe has provided us with tools that will be essential to address other public health problems. Just to give an example, Vaccine developers have already entered into more than 200 technology transfer agreements. More than 200, just post COVID. And the scaling up of global manufacture of vaccines is going to be critical to tackle future pandemics. So we need to be agile as an international community. We need resilience as an international community. And most importantly, we need to be able to withstand the inevitable challenges that are ahead of us. Once the pandemic is over, countries will need to build back better their economies. And we want to assure our countries, of course, <laughs> this is just an academic and practitioner gathering, but I am suggesting WIPO assures its member states it will be there to support governments use the intellectual property system as a tool for sustainable development. This pandemic has caused the world to adjust to a new normal, and this new normal will inevitably bring new social and economic practices. New technologies will be created. The IP system will be there to enable this innovation and without innovative tools to deal with the post-COVID situation, there clearly will be less opportunity to continue with the development trend that existed before the pandemic. So let me end by saying how great it is that Georgetown University and Hong Kong University have put together such a fantastic program. Clearly, for the next two days, we can discuss a lot of very important topics all COVID-19 related with some of the world's top academics, with some of the world's best practitioners in this area. And I very much look forward to the discussion and exchange of views. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kwakwa, for just kicking this conversation off so wonderfully um, and for your, for your wonderful remarks. Uh, we only have a few minutes, but I wanted to give you a couple more minutes really um, to expand on the post-pandemic because uh, and the next pandemic, and I'm gonna um, uh, turn to a question that was asked by one of our par um, uh, participants in the audience, Dr. Elise Feitchen. She's also an LLM student uh, at Georgetown Law, perhaps the next Darren Tang. <laughs> and, uh, but um, Dr. Feitchen asks uh, for you to talk about to the extent to which the existing exceptions and limitations in TRIPS have not really been robust enough or, or, or have, has this pandemic exposed, as she writes the quote, flaws in the existing program, uh, paradigm? And what could you see as at the high level, because we don't have a lot of time, but the high level reforms that what might be needed um, as we come out of this pandemic and prepare for the next one? What are the high level reforms where, that, where you think um, uh, the flaws have been most exposed? Thank you very much. 
uh, incidentally, I used to work at WTO before I came to WIPO. So I try as much as possible not to comment on WTO issues because people always say I'm trying to make WTO look bad just because I'm at WIPO. But on this specific question, my take would be, of course, WIPO is not the depository to the WTO TRIPS agreement, but it's very clear to me that there are specific exceptions and limitations in the TRIPS agreement that are already not being adequately used. So I don't think it's so much an issue of we need to ramp up or we need to revise the TRIPS agreement, but it's more members already have an opportunity that they are not using. Let me just give an example. I think recently it was Bolivia and another country have indicated their intention to compulsorily get vaccines and use them for the COVID-19 pandemic. The TRIPS agreement actually does provide for that. It's already there and surprisingly, it's not being used. So when it comes to exceptions and limitations, I think it's just a function of seeing how much better members can use the already available facilities within the TRIPS agreement itself. I believe TRIPS is broad enough for members to use whether they want government to use exception, compulsory licensing. They do have mechanisms under TRIPS to be used. This waiver discussion going on, I know there is pressure to reach agreement before the ministerial. Again, let, let me not comment on it. I may say something inappropriate, but my sense there too is it's hard to believe the minute they adopt a waiver on the proposal that solves the pandemic problem. It definitely won't. At best, it will make it worse. But again, this is for the WTO members. The discussion is taking place in WTO and luckily for us in WIPO, we are not the depository to the TRIPS agreement. But I think the TRIPS agreement as it is now already has clear flexibilities that can actually be used but are not being adequately used. Thank you. Well, um, thank you so much for these remarks. And if everyone can join me in a round of uh, applause for our uh, kickoff keynote speaker, Dr. Kwakwa, thank you so much. Um, you. We're going to keep moving forward with the program now. I'm going to invite uh, my uh, colleague at Georgetown Law, Professor Anupam Chander, to the moderator of the next panel and uh, the uh, speakers, uh, the illustrious speakers on uh, our first panel to join us.